Oops, <laughs> fucking up the lens. Hi guys, welcome to today's video. Today I thought I would do something a little bit different. I saw this El Cheapo Prit watercolor palette in a grocery store this weekend when I was out with my mom and I got this idea. I know other people have done this before, but you know, there's no harm in doing it again and I've always wanted to try this for myself and um, I think it will make a useful teaching tool because people always ask me what kind of paint should I use, what kind of paint should I use, where should I start, I'm a beginner, I don't know anything and I always explain this to them. So this would be a good visual aid to have, sort of a, an accompanying video tutorial if you will. Okay so what I have here is a little watercolor set from Prit which if you're South African, this is pretty much the go-to school glue. I think most people had Prit at one stage or another. It's a household item, very practical, multi-purpose glue. So I was interested to see that they now also make watercolors, which I'm assuming is aimed at young children or school children, or maybe just very, very casual hobbyists who have no need for paint to last a long time or for art to last a long time. Right, so I'm going to unbox this and I will be back. It's actually not a bad looking palette, I actually quite like the design of this. I see you get a terrible, your typical little brush. Actually it looks, maybe they've improved brushes since I was a child with these cheapy grocery store watercolor sets. This certainly looks a lot better than the ones I used to get, which were essentially they looked like feather dusters. It was just like this crappy acrylic bristle that just stood like that. And uh, you were at the mercy of it. So what I have here in front of me, if I can just get this tape off. This is a 12 color grocery store print set of watercolors. This is my Cotman palette, which is a uh, Windsor Newton student grade range. This is what I basically I would say used to start off my current watercolor journey. Bought this at the Dickel Edge. Uh, this was my Christmas gift one year. I decided to pursue watercolors full time and my husband was kind enough to get this for me. I've been very happy with it. I've since moved on to higher grade paints but this is still I have a soft spot for this palette and I still take it with me when I travel. I do have other palettes now that are more portable so I'll probably be taking those but this is still a firm favorite for if I want to go out and do some, just some casual sketching that doesn't use fancy paper or requires fancy paint. It's very nice. I like that it has a lot of mixing wells, unlike, I mean, I love this palette from Schmenke, but I mean, you don't have a lot of places to mix. It's literally just this and this, where this palette, you have this and you have this, and you have this if you were to want to use it. I normally just stick to the top two, but I mean, there are so many wells in this and they're really nice. You got your big ones and you got your small ones and there is also some space here for you if you want to put some, I sometimes put little takeaway salt packets in here if I want to do some salt work or I put some, like you, you can see here, I've got a nice burnt sienna from Holbein. I've got a mauve which is not included in these half pans. I sometimes I even stick other brands half pans in here. This is a very nice set. So Cotman, which is a student grade range. And then I have here um, Daniel Smith paints. And I have some Schmincke paints, which are both professional grade. And what I want to do today is I want to show you what happens when you paint on the wrong kind of paper and when you paint on the right kind of paper. And I also want to show you what happens when you paint with a lower grade paint versus a higher grade paint. So I've got here some normal just printer paper. I call it printer paper, I guess. I'm not sure what other countries call it, but it's literally just this, the flimsy stuff you stick in a printer and print, um, you know, bank statements or whatever off. This is a fantastic, huge, pad of watercolor paper that I got from my wonderful friend Kleena. Um, Kleena, if you're watching this, thank you so much for this. I've been using it. As you can see, there's a sizable chunk out of it already. But this, it says A4 acid-free cold pressed. It's 300 grams, uh, 140 pound paper. But this is not proper, proper watercolor paper. This is wood pulp. It is not a uh, cotton content paper, which means Yes, it works for watercolor, but this is not what you would be using for a client's work if you want your work to last and to 
not degrade over time, wood pulp is something you want to avoid. This one definitely has sizing on it, which is a gelatin layer or similar that people put on watercolor paper in order to get the paint to not simply sink into the page, but to sit on top nicely so you can work with it. It's also the thing responsible for those nice little crisp edges. When paper is sized, paint will lie down on it and make these nice edges without sizing. Well, you'll see what happens in a second. And then I have here some 300 gram bocking food. It's a good mid-range paper. It's made by the St. Cuthbert's Mill in the UK. Um, I really, really like this paper for casual projects. It's a good paper. It's not extremely pricey and the finish on it is quite nice. It is unfortunately a little bit prone to buckling, but I mean that's just because I don't tape my pages and I work uh, with very wet washes. The description on the website lists it as 100% wood-free bleached chemical pulp. The paper, however, is listed as acid-free and archival. Calcium carbonate buffered, pH 7 to 9. Internally sized, meaning the sizing is not just a coat on top. I think they actually put it in the pulp of this paper. Um, four cut edges, natural woolen, felt textured, short grain, suitable for watercolor, acrylic wash, pastel, pen and ink, pencil and charcoal. This would last a bit longer than your cheaper papers, but still, I would say if you're doing work for clients, get a proper cotton content paper because that is going to last a lot longer and your clients will be much happier. Now, finally, I have here a piece of slightly off-white. Saunders Waterford, which is 100% cotton paper. You can see it's quite thick as well. The one that I have here is 638 grams. I'm not sure what that is in pounds. It's quite thick and hence will not buckle as easily. This is a piece I've cut off a larger sheet. As you can see, they've got nice thicker edges when you buy the big sheets. The technical information for this paper, cylinder mold made, 100% cotton, acid-free and archival, calcium carbonate buffered, pH seven to nine, Gelatine surface sized, internally sized, four decal edges, which is these little ruffles you see. Two natural, two torn by hand unless stated otherwise. So two of these, I'm assuming this is the hand torn one because it's a bit more jagged and abrupt. Whereas this one tapers more, so this is probably the natural edge where the paper was actually molded. And approved by Royal Watercolor Society of Britain. Ooh, that's nice. Um, Okay, <laughs> I guess that's not really too relevant to us today. But yeah, so this is what you would be using or something like this if you're doing work for clients. Now, how should we do this? So just for fun, I'm going to add a mid-range brush and a high-end brush and then we can paint with all three and all these papers with all the paints and we can compare them afterwards. Ooh, this basically just looks like food coloring mixed with chalk pressed into little pans. <laughs> I don't have very high hopes for this paint. So I have a uh, primary-ish colors for all these. So I think I'm gonna try and just stick to those for this demo. So as you can see, I've labeled these columns poor, mid and good. This is the crappy little brush. This is a mid-range brush and this is a good brush. Uh, the brands here are Prit. Cartman, Daniel Smith and Schmenke and this is the normal printed paper. Oh, it's even branded print. Cute. Let's dive into this blue here. I can already see it's going down with a very chalky finish. It's very pasty if I can put it that way. The color isn't bad though. It's certainly more vibrant than the old sets I was used to. You can already see the paper starting to buckle. It's already not looking great. And as you can see, the paint just gets sucked into the paper. There's nothing lying on top and um, making it easy to work with pretty much where you put the paint down is where it's going to stay. Let's try this red which upon wetting seems more like orange to me. So, you know, I would normally add some water here to lift up some of this paint. 
It's messing a little bit at the cost of the paper surface. So yeah, the colors are <laughs> already looking very dull with this mix. And the paper surface is not really giving us much to work with. Next, this yellow. Yellow is actually not bad looking. But again, the surface of the paper is not conducive to re-wetting and lifting and it doesn't stand up to a lot of abuse, you know. I'm really I'm trying not to rub across the surface of the paper too much, so I'm pulling, but even just putting the tip of the brush down, the moment it hits the paper I can feel it disturbing the fibers. You can re-wet it a little bit, but you basically, the surface of the paper starts looking like suede. Because there's no sizing, the paper is very thin, you're basically dissolving the paper as you're working on it. Now for the mid-range paintbrush. I have here a number 6 Zen Royal Langnickel. This is quite a nice brush, got it from Jet Pens. It's um, synthetic bristle, but I really like the way it handles. For a brush that's not too crazy expensive, this is actually quite a decent one. So I'm going to be using this for the next block, which is the still on the print. We're going to be basically doing the same in all these blocks for the sake of consistency. Already this handles a lot better and it puts the paint down a lot easier. I'm not damaging the surface of the paper so much. Next the red. Because the bristles are a lot softer, it um, doesn't quite fluff up the wet fibers in the page as much as the other brush did. Ugh, but working on this paper is just not great. I <laughs> would not recommend. Hmm. The yellow color is quite decent, but I do not have high hopes for its light fastness. I don't even think these grade of paints get tested. I think they just assume it's going to be kids and whatever playing playing with them. So it's not really necessary to tell the user how long it's going to last or if it's archival or whatever. But yeah, rule of thumb, no, it's not. <laughs> It'll probably fade within a day if you leave it in the sunlight. Now, a good brush. A natural bristle brush. Ah, oh, such a pleasure to work with this brush. Natural hair holds so much water and it holds a lot of water and therefore it holds a lot of pigment because the pigment follows the water. So the load on your brush is going to be quite nice. So if you need a lot of color in a certain area, a natural bristle brush is actually better because you won't have to dip into your paint as often. With watercolor drying can mean the difference between having hard edges in a wash and not. So having a brush that you don't have to remove from the page to go and fetch more paint is actually quite, quite useful. I really don't enjoy using this brush on this paper though. I feel bad for it. I feel like I'm offending it somehow. <laughs> offending my own sensibilities here. So yeah, I find it um, a little bit more satisfying to paint with these two brushes, but you know, the quality of the paper and the paint is removing any pleasure that I might have gotten, kind of cancelling it out. Yeah, a little bit easier to blend with this one, but still it's not ideal, really not ideal. So what's interesting that you can already see is that the surface of the paper looks less damaged where I used the softer brush, which makes sense because this paper is so prone to balling up. Look at this. Can you see that where the hard edges of the cheap brush actually started lifting up the paper? The softer brush also did it, but not as much. And the softest brush, the natural bristle, ended up hardly doing it at all. I mean, a little bit. But you can definitely see tiny little balls of paper forming on the other colors. Except for that the softer brush actually didn't disturb the paper surface as much, so it displays a bit smoother and it looks a bit nicer. But honestly, I mean, if you turn around, look at that. It's terrible. Never use this paper. Okay, so next up I have my Cotman's. Right, back to our El Cheapo brush. We'll start off with a blue. I believe that might be similar. Let's see. I guess that's comparable, but I actually have phthalo blue here. 
Actually, let me do that. Let me use Stella Blue so I can show you how big of a difference it makes. Because this, this cobalty, Thalo cobalt hybrid, whatever color, is the richest blue that this palette has. Let me show you the richest blue that this palette has so you can see the difference. Already you can see it's much more vibrant. Oh, this brush is bad. Oh, it feels bad to paint with this. Look how nice and rich that is compared to this chalky blue. But yes, this brush <laughs> is not great to paint with. Oh, it's ruining the paper. Um, then what do we use? Red? Okay, let's do this nice vibrant red here. Cadmium red hue. So these are also not very light fast, but I mean, whoa, just look at the difference between these already, even on this crappy paper. And it, I mean, it mixes a lot more easily while wet. It's still not great for the paper and it still feels terrible painting with this brush. But it does re-wet off the paper a little bit more easily, which is actually surprising. I thought this paper would make re-wetting impossible. Visually, this yellow looks kind of similar to a mix between the lemon and the cadmium yellow. Let's just try this one. Yeah, it looks about similar, except for obviously being a lot more vibrant. So already the difference is clear, just between student grade watercolor and the grocery store one. Gosh. This brush just really, really eats the surface of the paper. There's not much I can do to get around it, not if I actually want to mix the paints. See, now I'm adding more water and that's even worse for the paper. So I can't use this paper like I enjoy working with watercolors normally. Ugh. See, I'm just making pulp, essentially, on the page. Now, the mid-range brush. It's already so much better. Oh, gosh. There is really nothing wrong with student grade paint just for playing around and for practicing and experimenting. It's actually really not that bad. There's no reason for you to dive straight in and get high-end paints with a high-end price tag if all you want to do is play and experiment. I still use my Cotman's a lot when I play and experiment. When we travel on the plane, I love having my little Cotman set there and I love playing. I have a, a small A6 watercolor postcard thing. And I just do tiny little quick studies and quick little paintings on the plane while we're in transit. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The colors are still nice and vibrant. It's just literally the commercial aspect and how long you want your paintings to last. Mixing with this brush on the page is a lot easier because I'm not using the tip of the brush like, like with the other one, essentially scrubbing up the paint and mixing it around, I am using the flat side of the bristles to gently nudge up the paint. But yeah, you can see these hills and valleys are forming. It's because this paper does not like water. It was not designed to get wet. It was designed to either take toner or very, very light amounts of inkjet ink. Now the good brush. What a pleasure to paint with this brush. It's just so, it, it feels so soft and creamy to paint with these. I understand if you're vegan or you have a problem with these brushes in principle, there is no need to spend hundreds or thousands on fancy animal products, fancy, you know, sable hair brushes, if you have a principal problem against it or you can't afford it or whatever, whatever reason you have for not wanting to get these brushes, that is 100% fine. You can create masterpieces with, you know, standard synthetic bristles and with, you know, lower end brushes. Just as you can see, if you go too cheap, it's not going to be great for the surface of your paper and it's going to be frustrating for you as an artist because you're going to have to keep dipping into your paint and the marks won't be nice and even. It's, it's very difficult to work with such a stiff bristled flat top brush like this. I mean, the tip isn't even tapered. It's literally just like that dude from Street Fighter. But uh, yeah, so honestly, please never let anyone make you feel pressured that you have to get high end sable brushes or whatever. It's fun to work with them, but like a luxury car, 
A cheaper one will still get you from A to B. A fancy one just is a bit more comfortable on the ride. That's really, that, that's really all there is to it. I would say though using a synthetic bristle mop brush is a little bit more difficult. So that's what we have for the good brush and it's definitely more flowy and pleasant. Right now for the Daniel Smiths. Daniel Smith I have mine yellow, pearl red and thalo blue. As you can see I have little dots on the lids of my tubes. I did this by painting a swatch and then hand cutting out a circle and super gluing it to the top because I hate not being able to see what color is inside. These things aren't really very indicative of the paint. It just literally gives you a guideline of what's inside but it doesn't tell you what the finish is actually like. This is a way different to this. So I tend to use tubes more than I use pans when I'm at home but when I travel I use pans. Oops. The binder separated out a little bit there. That's the problem with the tubes. If you leave them for long and then the binder comes out, the binder separates out and you end up squeezing a whole bunch of gum arabic onto your palette before the paint actually comes. Cheapy brush. <laughs> I almost feel bad using this nice paint with this crappy brush and this crappy paper, but for science. Taylor Blue. You currently see how nice and vibrant it is. Ooh, this brush, this brush. <laughs> Not good. Feels bad, man. It's almost like the paint goes down duller. I don't know how to explain it. It's like the brush destroys the paper even as I'm putting down the first stroke, making it impossible for the paint to perform like it should. See, I'm loading on more water, but I mean, the it holds so little water because it's plastic and it's not even a nice shape. It's literally just, in, in the car analogy, it's like, <laughs> I don't know, a Segway. Also gets you from point A to B, but do you really want to use a Segway to travel the 500 kilometers to your grandmother's house on the highway? Now, the Parallel Red. Wow, that's vibrant, beautiful. See how nice that is. Wow, it's bright. He's good, I like. The brush, however, I do not like. I mean, look how chunky these edges are. I, I can't get any kind of, you know, gradual, nice blend from one color to the other because this brush is just absolutely bull in a china shopping this paper smashing everything and rolling all little balls of paper everywhere and destroying the surface. It's bad, man. And when I add more water to try and combat that, it makes the paper even more vulnerable to, to tearing and lifting. Now, the Mayan yellow. This brush is difficult to rinse as well. The paint sort of gets stuck in those hard bristles and I have to work hard to get it out. Not a bad match actually for the other paints above. This one's a little bit more creamy, so it's a little bit more easy to blend. But yeah, it's um, <laughs> this is still <laughs> a war zone out here. It's kind of bad. I can't wait to move on to the better papers. Ooh. Imagine if I did this last, I'd just be so disappointed and sad. Now, the mid brush, Halo Blue. Not much to add from the previous experience, very similar. Just gonna add a little bit more color. Thalo Blue is so beautiful, it's one of my favorite colors ever. Now, Pearl Red. It's so much easier to blend with this. It's actually difficult to tell just from looking at, at the piece how good it feels to paint with this brush, what a difference it makes. Visually it might not look that different, but it's actually, I can assure you the difference is vast. Now mine in yellow. Got a little contaminated there, but that's okay. 
I mean, just look at this, the edges. I mean, I spoke too soon. I guess this edge isn't lifting because it's already sunken into the paper and lost to me forever, which is another reason why sizing is so important. But, I mean, look at this. It makes such a difference. Right, so, nice brush again. Phthalo blue. Phthalo blue is a very strong color, but on this paper, you practically need two or three times as much as you'd normally use because it just gets sucked up by the paper, never to be seen again. So all the paint that you thought that you would have to work with just disappears on you. That's why I'm trying to work as fast as I can. Apparel red. And for the way I like to paint, natural bristles are ideal. I do use my synthetic bristles quite a lot, especially for detailing because they stay nice and stiff. Natural bristles sometimes have too much of a give to them and you're busy painting a whisker and a cat or something. You don't want your brush suddenly just to go flat on you. You want it to stay nice and fine. Mayan yellow. I just, painting on this paper feels so bad, you guys. <laughs> it's just not fun, it's not a good time. I'm not gonna waste too much time trying to blend that in. Actually, let me just try this little area here. Now for the Schmincker, Chromium Yellow Hue Light, Thalo Blue, for the sake of consistency, Perilene Dark Red. Back to the crappy brush. Let's start in the bottom corner, shall we? Maybe I should start all of them from lightest to darkest. That actually makes a lot more sense. I'll do that from the next one on. The Perilene Dark Red. So you can see the colors go down nice and vibrantly, but the paper is just such a crappy quality that it ends up dulling down significantly. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that's sort of happening a little. Oh, this brush though. Right, and then the phthalo blue. This is nice and vibrant. Onto the mid-range brush. yellow so that I can try that blend again. Okay, the perylene red. Mm. Blends a little bit better, but still not ideal. Okay, so that blended a little bit, but not wonderfully. Now the good brush. Oh, I can't wait to move on from this terrible paper. <laughs> Just an absolute pleasure to work with these brushes. A little bit of blending going on, but not too much. Ugh, this paper though. we're done. Oh no, I'm sorry, that was out of shot. You didn't miss much, it's, uh, it's very similar to the ones above. So here we have our completed printer paper swatch test. Good lord, this has been unpleasant. I can't flip it over right now because some of the paint is still wet, but let me lift it up. As you can see, this is the print paint, dull as heck in student grade, Cotman, more vibrant, definitely more vibrant. You can see a big difference. Daniel Smith, also vibrant, 
but again ruined by the paper surface and the schminker which is still wet so it looks a lot more vibrant than all the others once it, once it dries I think it'll probably look very similar to the Cotman. This is why it's important to do swatch tests on different kinds of paper as well so you know how your paint will really perform.